Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> okay. You good. All right. Well, I want to welcome you tonight to our program um, with Tracy Linden from Therapeutic Leagues. Uh, Link, sorry about that. And her coworker, uh, Julie Bergen, is with her as well. Uh, Tracy had contacted me back in January of 2019 about being able to um, tap into her, her knowledge, her services, her area of expertise, so that it would benefit the homeschool community. And so I'm thankful that after a year and a half, we're finally able to do this, even if it does mean that we're doing it by Zoom. And so great, grateful that, that uh, they are both here to uh, teach us and give us some helpful information that will benefit everyone. So I um, just want to touch base with you if this is your first time joining us. My name is Colleen Ryan. And before I worked here at the Grays Lake Library, I spent 20 years homeschooling my four kids. It was a passion of my heart then and it still is now. And so I'm thankful that uh, at the Grays Lake Library, I can offer services and programs to the homeschool community. If you ever have any ideas as in regards to topics you'd like to see us cover, um, feel free to shoot me an email, and I would uh, very much enjoy interacting with you on that. I'm very intentional about making sure that our topics are meeting the needs of the homeschool community. So we want to be effective in the programs that we offer. Our next program will be on Thursday night, December 10th. Our topic is homeschooling multiple ages with ease. And uh, homeschool mom, Gina Mayo, will be with us. She has eight children, count them, eight children. Wow. And she has been homeschooling for 15 years. She currently has two in college, two in high school, two in middle school, and two in elementary school. And she's not crazy yet. And so uh, she is gonna be sharing with us some uh, real practical things in regards to how do you navigate that and how do you schedule your day and and there'll be a great time for some questions and answers also and so that is thursday december 10th so um i hope you're able to join us for that and um like always that will be another zoom program that we're able to have so well as you know tonight we are talking about sensory and behavior are are the the things that you are seeing in your child what's the um kind of the source or the root of it? Is it potentially a sensory issue or is it a, a behavioral issue? And Tracy and Julie are also gonna touch, touch on autism as well as some life skills that we can be teaching our kids about. And so uh, Tracy and Julie, thank you for being here. As, and let me tell you this too, they are open to answer any questions that you have. So as you have questions, just put them in the chat. Lauren Hilty, uh, my colleague is here and she will be navigating questions in the chat. And then as we go, we will be able to have those questions answered by Tracy and Julie throughout their presentation. So, all right, go for it girls. Awesome, I will go ahead and share my screen. It looks like Darcy has a question. Yeah, I was just gonna say, can you also possibly um, talk about how like sensory and behavior, whatever intertwines with like ADHD or ODD, things like that? Or is that a whole different topic? Not really. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we definitely can talk about that. Yeah, when things come up throughout the presentation, you know, just so that we are gearing this towards what your needs are, absolutely throw out those questions. Um, we have a lot of information. Actually, I have to give credit to Julie. She put, uh, we've been doing these presentations, but we're kind of recreating some um, parts of the presentation. She put this together with a lot of, a lot of information. So I, I forget how much time do we have again? Until what time? Get to about 7.45. Okay. It's about an hour and 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. All righty. So here we go then. Perfect. All right. Say, oh, go ahead, Trace. We're gonna Julie and I just flow the way we flow. So again, it's um, uh, not a very formal setting. So please jump in and ask your questions or share your comments as well. Um, so who are we? You know, we're occupational therapists. Not everyone knows what occupational therapists do. So just to give you a little bit of information on that, Ocu the the word occupation is referring to things that occupy that individual for that 
whether it be life stage or whoever that person is, and we're talking about children right now. So occupations or activities that children um, do are things like the fine and gross motor skills, the visual motor skills, sensory processing. They have to be able to emotionally regulate and behaviorally regulate so that they can participate in their daily occupations of those self cares, being able to go to school, play with peers, do their own leisure activities, sleep well and socialize. Yeah, so th those are, you know, we encompass a big area. And so, you know, like we had mentioned throughout, this is very, you know, laid back. We want to see questions. Um, as you can see, we have a ton of topics on here. Um, and Tracy and I probably could talk for days on some of these things. Um, so please feel free to be like, yes, I need more information on that. Or, you know, that's something I really, really need. Um, and like Tracy had mentioned, our slides have a lot of information. So we may breeze through some of those, but know that um, we will definitely give these to Colleen. And so you guys can have a copy of those. So our very first thing is, you know, what is sensory processing? Um, and there's always a ton of questions on what that is and what that encompasses. And you'll see that we have that picture of the computer. That's the best way to really kind of give a symbol to what sensory processing is. And what it is, is it's how we take in the sensory information. And so it's not only our regular five senses. So, you know, sight, hearing, taste, smell, touch. We have actually a few more senses, um, two more specifically. One is uh, vestibular input, and vestibular input is our inner ear. It tells us where we are in space. It's definitely that little tickle when you're on a slide, or you know that feeling that you're nauseous um, when you you know you go to Great America. Um, that's our vestibular system. The other piece is proprioception. Proprioception is the connection of our muscles and joints. It is that major grounding force. Um, the best way to understand that is, you know, after you've really had a, a really good workout, a good run, and your body feels heavy, that's proprioception. And so sensory processing, it began through gene errors back in the 1970s. And it has evolved since then, and they're now adding a couple of more um, senses. And one main one is interoception. And that is actually how we feel when we have to use the bathroom, when we're hungry and those kind of things. And that is actually a big one now because it is so important for a lot of our kids because a lot of our kids don't understand that. So we take in all this information and it happens constantly throughout the day. And then our brain has to say, what is this information? Is it safe? Do I need it? Um, and how should I respond to it? And so it's almost like those old school computer systems. You enter the information in, it processes it, it goes to the files where it needs to go, and then it has a response. And that is what sensory processing is. Um, and it is so quick the way that this happens in our brains. And so it is telling you, okay, I'm taking this information in. Um, I smell smoke. Wait a second, smoke's not a good thing to smell. It's going to go right to our frontal lobe to say, hey, I need to get out of here. And then you're going to be able to execute your body and get out. And so, as you can tell, it takes longer to talk about it than it does to actually happen in your brain. So the big thing is really looking at our systems from a bottom up approach, um, especially when we're teaching kids and things like that. It is so easy to throw a lot of cognitive information into our bodies. The hard part is, is that if we would look at our bodies like this, and it, it looks like a pyramid, but it's actually a three-dimensional period because uh, pyramid because there's so many different things that come through and it's multi-dimensional. Um, but as you can see, that cognition and that intellect is way, way, way up at the top. Meaning that if all those other systems below, if they're crumbling, you don't have a foundation to work off of. And so if you don't have that foundation, 
that learning, that intellect is going to be extremely hard. And so this is, I love this, this visual because it really tell, tells parents like, hey, we got to get those sensory systems in order. We have to get that nervous system in order too. And we're going to touch base a little bit more on the nervous system as well. Go ahead, Trace. So some examples of dysfunction of sensory processing are when um, so these are actual examples. I think the next slide talks about the hyper and the hypo. Um, but kids who have to cover their eyes because it's too bright out or they have a hard time concentrating and focusing possibly because they're tuning into the noise coming from the fluorescent light bulbs. Um, it might be a picky eater and resisting to try new foods, or on the flip side of that, they chew on everything or both. Um, coordination is challenging for the kids because when their brains are not able to process that information, see an example that I usually give and I'm standing up and I act it out. So I'm like, ah, oh, I'm sitting here, I can't do that. But an example I usually give is when we trip, and we start going forward, we don't tell ourselves, hey, put your arms out so that you don't smash your face in the ground. Actually, our brain processes that information and we automatically put our arms out. And so that's our vestibular system, sensing that properly. Um, and then we are able to save our, our face and our head. But kids that don't have that vestibular and proprioceptive sense, they end up being, they call, they're called clumsy or uncoordinated, tripping and falling, or even they don't know how to move their body and execute higher levels of coordination, like riding a bike or doing different leisure activities. Um, for this one, Julie, what I did uh, earlier this week at a presentation, I just put on the YouTube because it's a really cute little YouTube and it's a different way of explaining things. I don't know if that would work. Um, let's not do that, actually. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. We, um, the, the link will be on there. Um, so when you open it, you guys will be able to go to that link. Um, otherwise, search the Teacup YouTube and um, Sensory. And okay. it is, it's a great information because it, he really talks about that over-responsive and that under-responsive kid. Um, and so that over-responsive, that means they are, you know, pretty sensitive to information. Um, you know, as, as Tracy had mentioned, you know, maybe the lights are too bright. Um, you know, those kind of things. Uh, auditory information is way too much. Um, or they're the kids as soon as they walk into a room, oh my gosh, what does that smell? Um, and so that's that over responsive system. They will typically avoid situations that have that sensory input. Um, they might also look Sorry, was there a question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, can um, if um, like if they're sensitive to like loud noises or something, um, do you sometimes notice that maybe like they're sensitive to loud noises in one setting, but maybe not another? Is that Absolutely. common? Yep. It Absolutely. is. Absolutely, it is. Okay. It's very common. Context is. Um, it is actually a big component because if our bodies are not grounded in a certain situation and we're not having that um, feeling of safety, then what's going to happen is any kind of information can be way overstimulating. Um, and so it is, it, it, it is very tricky because they may not show it in one setting, but they can show it into another. Um, so then you have the under responsive. You know, these are the kids that, you know, will fall on top of you, that kind of just, you know, lay when they're trying to do their homework. Um, they're also the thrill seekers, you know, they're jumping off steps and things like that. These are also the kiddos that, you know, they, they're typically on the go. Um, and so they're moving and constantly trying to find, you know, more information for their body. And then, of course, there's 
right in the middle. So I would love to say that sensory is black and white, but it is absolutely not. <laughs> there are tons of shades of gray with you know, sensory information in those things. And, you know, case in point, what Darcy had mentioned is just being in a different context is huge. Um, so there's those kids in the middle. They might avoid and are super sensitive to one thing, but may seek other information. Oh, hold on. Not sure. There we go. And so, you know, we wanted to pull this in a little bit, and this is where we can pull in some of the ADD, ADHD, and things like that, is, you know, there was always questions, oh, you know, I see sensory, you know, difficulties with my child, does that mean my child has autism? No, it doesn't. It has been, you know, like I said, uh, sensory processing has really come into effect from the 1970s. It has been historically since then, very problematic. It's problematic with billing. It's problematic for, um, you know, doctors to give that diagnosis. It's problematic for pediatricians to even notice some of these things. It is, like I said, there's so many shades of gray that there's not a lot of information um, to be really clean cut. And the other problem is that insurance companies don't necessarily see this as an uh, area of need either. Um, so one thing that, you know, as the DSM, so the DSM is that criteria for psychologists to use to, or psychologists, to give that information of that diagnosis. And so with that is they show up all this information on what autism is. And what it, it is telling us is that, yes, when you have autism, a huge piece of that is sensory processing dysfunction but it's not necessarily vice versa. So as you can see in that little um, you know, circular cue here is that there, it's very, very rare will you see a child with autism or on the autism spectrum that doesn't have sensory information. Um, again, they're doing a ton of uh, extra research out there and they're really trying to find out is you know, sensory processing a primary component within the gen genetic makeup of someone with autism, or is it just a secondary consequence? Um, which is also a really big thing to know too, um, as we move forward and, and try to really push of the importance of sensory processing disorder. Um, and I, I don't wanna necessarily go fully into depth on all of this, but again, I, the big thing here is to let you know that autism spectrum disorder it's not linear. It is, again, just like sensory, it is this multi-dimensional, um, almost globe. And, you know, a, a way to really think about it is there's all these different pieces of the pie, communication, um, you know, uh, motor components, uh, intellect, all those different things, compassion. And what it looks at is where, is where does that child sit? So if the center of that core was at, does not have any skills, you know, that, that would be the very middle. And then if you go branch out to the bigger circle, that's saying yes, has all these skills. And so what you'll find is within those different pieces of pie, you may see intellect is super high, compassion is towards the middle and super low. And so when you evolve this globe, it's very difficult because not one child with autism is alike. And that's where it's very difficult to categorize children on this. Um, and so that's, again, from a therapist standpoint, when we see a diagnosis of autism, it's not we're going to go to the DSM and we're going to look we are gonna look at that whole child and we wanna look at all those different components. We're gonna look at the sensory stuff, but we're also gonna look at where that intellect is. How does that child learn? Because can we use that to get into other areas? Um, and so here's, here's the spectrum. And I, I loved this, this cartoon that they had here because again, it shows here language is super high, but motor skills are not that good. Sensory filtering is not that good, um, but perception of certain things is great. So again, here's a child that is can be categorized on the autism spectrum. However, there's a lot of other areas that they do really, really well with. 
And so here's where we're just going to just do a, a brief snippet of some of the life skills. Um, but, you know, a big thing is, you know, are those life skills understanding, you know, I have to wake up in the morning, I have to brush my teeth, I have to comb my hair, I have to be presentable. And then, you know, I have to do my schoolwork, I have to do X, Y, and Z, I may have chores, all those different areas. And the hard part is that autism, but actually any kids with motor planning difficulties, ADHD, ADD, any of those things, that, you know, inability to kind of process and perceive motor information, their life skills are going to be impacted. Um, so it, it goes back to what I was saying before. It's really important to find those strengths of a child and use that to your advantage to get to some of those areas of needs. And, you know, uh, this is part of the plug and, you know, those things, um, if you notice that some life skills and in here is where we listed a lot of um, just information, you know, at certain ages, one to two, five to six, um, and we also have, you know, middle school, high school. If they're not able to do those and do them consistently, then that is a red flag. And what, you know, we want to see what else is going on in those kind of things. And that's where it is important to contact us, let us know, and we can kind of um, collaborate with you to say, okay, what else is going on? It may not just be the life skills, but, you know, as I go back to that pyramid, there's probably more underlying stuff that's going on as well. Um, so again, just a, a good thing to have kind of in your back pocket, always try to think about, um, you know, where's my child at, at these times. So go ahead, Trace. Yeah. And I was going to also bring up, um, one of our therapists, Brenna, actually, she has made a bunch of different videos and put them on our YouTube channel for individuals who need some more broken down guidance on how to do certain life skills. They are more geared towards individuals with autism, but can be used for, I mean, any kids, even if they're younger and they need to be reminded how to do or be taught how to do step-by-step -step certain life skills or chores. So um, I just thought of that, come into action there. And then with the I don't know, Darcy, I think with the ADHD, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, could you just say what her name is again or how do we find those videos? Well, yep. you, you, you can, can, you can um, there's different, different ways you can go. You can go on YouTube and search for therapeutic links or you can go to therapeuticlinks.com and there's actually a YouTube icon. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, and you were saying um, about ADHD, what were you saying? Sorry. Yeah. So I think that the crossover with um, how there can be comorbidity between ADHD and sensory processing, as well as ODD and sensory processing might come more apparent, become more apparent as we keep talking about um, self-regulation and difficulties with self-regulation -regula and what that does for kids. So how it impacts Great. them. Yep. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's look at behaviors. So there are functions of behaviors we look at. So as occupational therapists, and also too, I'm a, I'm a mom of three. I did not homeschool. I actually have, um, my husband's a teacher. So um, I guess he did kind of homeschool them because he couldn't help himself <laughs> or he continues to. Um, but as an OT, we always ask, hmm, why is that child behaving that way? So we're always trying to get to the root of that challenging behavior and figure out uh, the reasoning behind the, the behavior the best that we can. And that helps guide us on how best to support the kids. Um, the, some of the functions of the behaviors that we look at are the sensory regulation, whether or not the child is trying to escape a situation or avoid a situation, whether it be a non-preferred task or something else, something uncomfortable, whether they're trying to get attention or they're trying to get something tangible. Oh, sorry, hold on. Not sure what happened. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's just important to figure out or try your best to figure out 
the why and the cause of the behavior. Um, and then also be aware of how people around the individual are responding to the behavior because that also can be reinforcing it. Uh, and that can help when you're looking at behaviors and whether or not it's a sensory piece or it's not a sensory piece or it's both. Yeah, so the big thing we look at is, you know, what what is the child doing? Um, that's kind of the first thing. What What is that behavior? Is it biting? Is it kicking? Um, is it hitting someone? Is it screaming? Is it a tantrum? Is it avoiding? And then what we really do is we look at, okay, what, what else is going on? And, and this is where detective skills are, are really important um, because you wanna see exactly what happened right before that situation. And you're gonna look at all the different things. What context was it in? Um, what, you know, the information, yes, Darcy. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, what, um, you know, what sensory information is going on? And, you know, a, a big question that it is always, you know, asked, parents always ask, is it sensory or is it a behavior? Well, sensory is actually a function of behavior. So it's not necessarily that question of, is it sensory or is it behavior? It's more so, is sensory a function of that behavior. And so, because we can have behaviors for all different things and sensory could be that component. Um, one thing to know is that when there is a behavior, very, very rarely is it just solely sensory related um, because there's a lot of different information and it can be, behaviors are typically multifunctional. And there's reasons why kids do this. Again, it's, it's our, our brains, they want the best and the easiest thing available. Um, and so one thing to look at is the acronym of SEAT. And so SEAT, you know, first what you're looking at is wh what's, where's the sensory information? Does it provide stimulation to that pleasure zone of the brain? Um, when is it happening? Um, you know, when, you know, it, this can happen at any time, the child can be anxious, the child can be excited. And then, you know, what can you do and providing that uh, techniques to redirect and those kind of things. And we're going to kind of delve into more of those utilizing sensory techniques, because the best part about utilizing sensory techniques is a lot of times if it has to do, if a behavior has to do with the other three, escape, um, attention or tangible, a lot of times the sensory aspects that we utilize as tools to help will also help with those aspects and those functions of behavior too. Um, so then the next thing is escape. Um, it, it, it clearly is what it means. It, you, you remove that undesired activity or interaction. Um, you know, a lot of times the task is too hard. It's it's maybe too easy, maybe it's too boring. And again, this is where it gets very, very difficult for those kiddos with ADHD and that high movement activity because is it ADHD or is it a function of behavior? So is this kiddo avoiding and moving those kind of things because you know maybe that activity is too easy, that activity is too hard? So, and this is where there's a lot of crossovers, as Tracy had, had mentioned, with a lot of different disorders and things like that. Um, and so when we can be really good detectives and kind of look at addressing behaviors and trying to nip those things first, and then can we see, um, you know, the rest of the day and those kind of things. Um, then the next function of behavior is attention, you know. I want mom's attention. I want dad's attention, those kind of things. I want the attention, you know, of my sibling. Um, and, you know, they, they want that social interaction. They're kind of seeking that social interaction. Um, and the hard part is that when that happens, we, whether positive or negative, they're going to get that reinforcement. And as soon as they get that reinforcement, it's, ah, thank you very much. I'm going to do that again. And a, the brain, again, is very smart. It's going to go to the least restrictive thing. And if, it, and if we know that, hey, I threw a tantrum and I got those M&Ms, I'm going to do it again because that was so easy. Um, and so then, yes, yeah, yeah, so, well, I just wanted to ask if you could kind of speak to that um, because 
obviously when kids are being super challenging, it's really hard not to react to them, especially if they're being infuriating. And um, so, so I just didn't know if you had any tips on how to like, you know, yeah. Absolutely. And you know, <laughs> I, I do have on there that there, there are very few behaviors that we can ignore because they're aggravating. And what happens is as those happen, then you know our arousal level starts going up and then we just get angry. Um, and so a big component is you know, really looking at the environment, trying to provide um, you know, different sensory aspects of things to, to really help hone in um, and make things a little bit easier. Um, there can be a lot of other stuff going on. Um, and as the way we address through a sensory aspect um, in a little bit, we'll go over you know, five different ways to really look at that big picture. What can you do you know, before you even start the day and see what is gonna work, what's not gonna work. Um, and so it's, it's a lot of you know, um, almost trial and error to really see what's gonna work best for this child. Um, and, you know, uh, again, it, it almost goes back to, um, you know, a child is doing some of these things and they're not doing that to aggravate you. And typically they are not. There is a reason behind these behaviors. And a lot of times as hard as it is as a parent, we kind of have to step back and look at everything. Um, another thing to really think of is um, this, this kept coming up to me is connection before correction. The first thing we want to do is say, stop doing that. Stop shaking that. Stop, you know, sit in your chair. Um, but unfortunately, again, that's going towards the, con the, the cognitive level and it's trying to tell someone to do something versus, okay, I want to get a connection with you and just be like, hey, what's up? Like, I see you're running around, like what's going on? And kind of just come back and try to find that connection with the kid to, to, to let them know, hey, I'm, I'm empathizing with you. Something's going on, but I don't quite know what. And so getting that connection and then utilizing those sensory approaches to work from that bottom up to see, can we get to that cognitive level of learning? And then it's gonna be easier to let them know like, you know, when you're, you know, biting your pencil, that actually really aggravates me. So what can we do differently? You know, stuff like that. And I don't know, Darcy, if you're speaking like specifically to the ODD aspect. Uh, well, I mean, I don't think it's specific to ODD because I think a lot of that is um, probably ADHD also. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. And, um, I, I was, I was going to ask you a question and I forgot. <laughs> well, here I'll, I'll keep, cause what I was going to say is something that we realize have realized over the years. Well, like, so we'll keep talking. We're going to share how there are different um, programs to teach self awareness and then to be able to work towards self regulation. But what we've learned is that if the child doesn't have, if the child's not invested in it for anything, they don't care. They don't, it, it's too hard of work to use strategies, use tools to be able to stop a certain behavior or la you know, not lash out or whatever it might be. So then it goes back to some of those, you know, I guess, well, it goes back to connection. So what's meaningful to the child and then, or individual, and then how can I motivate that individual to achieve this goal? And that is somewhat of a behavioral approach where you're looking at, okay, in, I mean, ideally we'd love for it to be a complete, you know, natural in, in internal motivation to want to do better, be better and all these things. But many times you need to start with an external earning motivation and then you work towards that internal motivation and a, a big thing so I have a, oh yeah go ahead well i just said i have a couple questions one i wanted to ask like um it's one thing to understand it right and another to execute it number one number two um i 
I think I sometimes struggle with, even if you're on board yourself and, and you can kind of do that, you know, fairly okay, um, then you have to deal with, you know, the spouse and the siblings and the teacher and the, you know, and kind of how do you like, you know, help to, right, get other people on board because if you can get to a point where you can kind of like hone it in or something, but then, you know, somebody else says something and all of a sudden we're here, you know? Um, so that was one thing. And then the other thing was um, you had mentioned the um, importance of not reacting right away, not scolding right away, but like kind of asking questions, what's going on, you know? Um, what, how do you handle that when the, the, they don't know? Like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, when the answer is, I don't know. So, so I was going to say that first with the team piece or like everybody, the caregivers in the child's family, what we do when we have families that we work with and we hear what you're saying all the time, we encourage, you know, say, have dad call me, have dad come to session so that somebody else that's explaining those things. And it's not just you know, mom, who's like all crazy and we got to do all these things, you know, saying it. So we're able to explain some of these things at a different level to the dad that maybe makes sense to a point. Same thing, we connect with the teachers as well um, and help support getting the whole team on the same page as best as possible. Um, but it's not an easy task, of course. Um, and then I don't know, I mean, I can talk too about the not reacting right away. I, you know, if, and Julie, you can jump in too after that, but I think in, in this did definitely has definitely helped me with my kids where, because I do think about the why of behavior, I, in raising my kids, I tended to to be able to step back and analyze it because for like as an occupational therapist, I found it interesting. <laughs> so I'd be like, hmm, this is very interesting behavior <laughs> that this child's doing. <laughs> and then, you know, then in my brain, I would have all these different ways I could approach it. I'd be like, all right, let's see if I do this and see what happens. And also knowing that when raising younger kids, and actually Colleen, like, I don't know, you might have some, I mean, you raised four kids and you were with them all the time too. Um, you know, I know raising younger kids, just knowing that the way that you react, they're going to spin off of that reaction as well. And um, that's, we term that and tell me, Julie, if I'm wrong, is like the co-regulation. So if I'm dysregulated, then my child's going to get even more dysregulated and it's just going to be a spiral effect. Um, so when kids, you know, fall and cut their knee, if we run over, we're like, oh my God, what's happening? You know, you're bleeding. Ah! Then that's going to be the way that they feel that they need to respond as well when they get injured. And that's a similar thing with certain behaviors as well. And a lot of times the kids aren't going to be able to answer you you know, what, what's going on? They're, they're not going to answer you. It's, however, putting that awareness to kind of connect the dots to say, hey, I, I noticed, you know, you were jumping up off of the seat. I, what, what's, what's going on with that? Um, and so sometimes it just gives that awareness because it could be that, um, you know, lack of understanding the, you know, oh, I have to go to the bathroom you know, maybe that's why I'm moving or I'm super hungry. So it's just a way to kind of give a little Im information to the child. Um, and then, you know, back to, you know, how do you get everyone? It, it is super hard. <laughs> and a big thing that I, you know, I tell families is let's take one piece at a time because it can seem very, very overwhelming. So what is one thing that, you know, you guys are like, I have to get this to stop. And then it's, how are we gonna address this? Okay, this we have to look at all the different team members and this is how we need to try responding. It is very hard, but look at it and chunk it out. And what's gonna happen is as you start chunking that out and you're addressing maybe you know this behavior, you might see that these other behaviors are actually gonna fall into place because if it is an underlying you know, sensory or attention, 
they're going to start understanding, oh, wait a second, I don't necessarily get what I want, you know, now that mom and dad are responding this way. So it is, it, it's very, it's very difficult. Um, and so this, you know, the next thing we, we have talked about, and, and Tracy touched base on this, is, you know, that understanding of regulation. And that also goes by, you know, why, why are you doing this? You know, why are you jumping out of your seat? Oh, well, I'm not sure, but I, I don't know how to control it. And so what happens is when the demands um, or the context of the activity do not match that current arousal level, it, there's a mismatch. And that's where you start, you can see, especially if it's related to sensory information, that you're going to see this fight, flight, or freeze behaviors. And when you start seeing that information, that's actually moving from, you know, a cortex, you know, trying to learn, it actually goes down even lower to the nervous system. And that's, you know, brainstem level. What's happening is there's information that I don't like, and I'm getting the heck out of here, or I'm fighting you on it. And so what happens is your body then goes into that sympathetic, um, you know, nervous system response and a child has no control when they're in that sympathetic response. And I, I just like to pinpoint that. So when you see that there's like, you know, the child starts breathing faster, the eyes, you know, the pupils are dilated, those kind of things, and the heart rate's super fast. We actually have to get towards that parasympathetic before we can even address behaviors or ask them what's going on or those kind of things, um, because they, they can't access that, that higher level of learning. And another interesting thing to, to kind of put in a little memory bank is a lot of times when there is, you know, a function of behavior that's sensory, especially when it's self injurious, they are when when they do that a lot of times what happens is when they're getting some kind of pain response and those kind of things it actually kicks on other neurotransmitters in the brain and what it kicks on is you know some things like serotonin that's your mood regulator it's also going to turn on dopamine and it's the dopamine's going to start firing it's also going to turn on adrenaline so those kids that bite themselves, they're going to actually tend to bite themselves more because the brain just gave them a natural response to say, this was actually great. Keep doing it. And then it actually turns into, you know, a repetitive thing that the child cannot escape from. And there's, again, that's kind of a different approach that we have to look at that because, again, the brain's, you know, trying to work and get to that homeostasis, but here's this influx of, this is actually really great. I want to keep doing it. And that can happen with some behavior, other behaviors, um, especially in relationship to sensory. So again, when there's a lot of behaviors that you're trying to manage, it is important to maybe touch base with an OT to see what else is going on, because there could be some other underlying stuff that's, that's there. Can you just try and um, explain again how, um, like, I, I kind of understand, but I'm trying to wrap my head around what you just said, like how that ends up being a rewarding and yeah. So what happens is, you know, for the, the child that's biting themselves, what it does to the brain is it actually first flushes with adrenaline because it is, it is pain. But what happens is our brain has a very hard time to process self-injurious behaviors. You know, a lot of times you say, oh, you know, can you pinch yourself to make it hurt? Not necessarily. It takes actually a lot for our body to do it because our automatic response is to let go. And so what happens is when you bite, you're not only kicking on adrenaline because you have to push through that, um, that automatic response that let go because it hurts. So you're pushing through that. As you start pushing through that and um, adrenaline starts to kick on, dopamine starts kicking on because it's like, wait a second, what, what's, what are you doing? What? Oh, wait, this, this is actually so much more enjoyable than you telling me to sit at the table. And so there's, again, another underlying function that, you know, I don't want to do something or 
you know, I have other pain going on and I'm going to do this because that's going to help minimize the other pain that's going on. And so when that happens, the neurotransmitters in, in our brain start to try to balance each other out and they're trying to make you feel better. It's not necessary from an outside perspective, that's not necessarily feeling better. But again, then it says, oh, it just gave that natural response and that positive reinforcement of, I felt good, I'm gonna do it again because I don't like that X, Y, and Z, so I'm gonna do this instead. So, you know, a big thing is that our brain wants us to feel good. Our brain wants us to feel safe. And so it's gonna, you know, start turning things on, start turning things off so we can feel safe. That is the biggest thing our brain wants. We want safety and we wanna, you know, control what is going on as much as possible. So yeah, there's a lot, a, a lot of different neuro that I could go into, um, but I don't wanna go into too much. Um, but I can definitely, you know, explain that and, the cycle of behavior and how that goes into, um, you know, the Golgi tendons and, and stuff like that. So there's a lot of, of different information on that. So, <laughs> um, so I, I put this on here um, just because I, I liked, you know, that, you know, there is a difference between a tantrum and a meltdown. And this is actually going back to, you know, this big difference on the bottom. Um, a tantrum is, you know, the kid really, really wants something. It's maybe that tangible. It might be, excuse me, that attention. As soon as that child gets it, all of a sudden, here's this happy kid, you know, let's go. We're great. So we know that, oh, okay, wait, he really wanted this. Now, a tantrum can actually move from a tantrum to a meltdown and what's going to happen is you're going to notice, okay, you give the child, you know, a hug or those kind of things and the child isn't stopping. And that's where you're seeing that it just moved from, you know, an organized nervous system. And now we just shot into that sympathetic nervous system and the child doesn't have control of that. And so that's where, again, you're still going to see that increase of heart rate, the sweating, um, the pupils, and it is very, very difficult. You cannot use that intellect. You can't necessarily talk to them when they're in that state because the auditory system shuts down. So it's, it's good to kind of understand and have some of that awareness of where's my child at? Is this a tantrum or is this a full blown meltdown? So go ahead, Trace. All right. So the child must move out of his sympathetic system into parasympathetic system in order to access his cortex. This is regulation. So this is that foundation piece of the sensory processing has to be working well so that an individual can regulate their, we call it their arousal system or their nervous system. And then once they're regulated, they're able to be ready to learn, um, be ready to grow, attend, and behave or um, function in any environment. So self-regulation is the ability to achieve, monitor, and change the state to match the demands of the environment and situation. Co-regulation refers to the social relationships and the way one can adjust themselves when interacting with another in order to maintain a regulated state. Each person has a different optimal range. Um, and some people have, and we call it like the, we call it the just right uh, area. And we kind of look at it like this and the just right even moves depending on what the activity is. Some people have a very narrow range where they'll be just right for a very short period of time. Then they'll sh go up and shoot off the handle or they'll go down and they'll get sleepy and tired. Other people have a larger range where they can handle many other events and still stay in the just right band. Here is a nice visual showing a normal day, whatever that is. We don't even know it. We definitely don't know what that is this day and age. But um, for an individual that knows how to or can process sensory information well. So 
this lady up at the top, she is, she gets up in the morning and she is low arousal because she's sleepy. Um, once she gets her cup of coffee, she's able to go to that just right because coffee is not just like a caffeine drug, but it's also a sensory experience. It's hot, it tastes good, it smells good, it feels good. So that gets her up to the just right, but then she gets maybe a mid-morning lull and goes back down her arousal and then she's able to go out for a walk. So she uses movement to be able to go back up to that just right so that she's able to function and maybe do, maybe she's at home doing laundry or she went to work and she's doing some work and able to function there. And then let's jump ahead to the 5.30 time. So if she's somebody that that's at work, then she's driving home and uh-oh, an event happens. And the event is that a car stops and slams, slams on this brakes in front of her and she then has to slam on her brakes. She actually ends up having an autonomic response. And I don't know if many of you have experienced this. I certainly have, unfortunately. Fortunately, no, there, you know, no injuries or hitting any cars, but where you end up actually maybe start sweating. You know, some people start swearing, so they get into that fight mode. Other people actually get out of their car and start wanting to fight. Um, and then sure, though, there's those people that freeze for a moment and think, oh my gosh, my, my breath is shallow and... I can't believe that just happened. Luckily, somebody who has a good processing si system is able to then calm themselves down enough to drive home versus just sitting there frozen and traffic honking around them because you can't drive your car anymore or versus actually getting out of your car and maybe starting to um, beat your car and destroy it. So that would be the fight, the fight factor. Um, when you're looking at individuals that have difficulty processing sensory information, and they also have difficulty regulating their nervous systems, you might take a kid like Paul here, who wakes up in the morning and he is just on edge all day long. So he never really comes down to that middle area of just right. He's always the kind of person where you might tap him on his shoulder and he would jump. Um, then you have Carl, who's more low arousal, and he has a hard time waking up in the morning. And no matter what event, even if it's a fire alarm, he's low, mo slow moving, low arousal, and slow responding. And so that um, actually came from the program, How Does Your Engine Run? Um, I actually, I don't have a slide on that. Um, so that is, um, how does your engine run really looks at it. It's great. I like using it for, um, a lot of younger children because it helps the child understand that my body can move slow. My body can move in the middle and my body can move on high. And we actually have to know that our bodies can go through that. And it's helping with that recognition of that, that state of arousal. Um, so that's how does your engine run? Um, how does your engine run also uses this five ways? Um, what's great about this program is that it's very, it's, it's from uh, uh, occupational therapist. So it's a very multi-sensory approach. It has music, it has a lot of visuals and those kind of things, a lot of kinesthetic learning to help kids understand oh, my body is a high engine right now, or my body's a low engine. Um, and then the other program, um, which uh, we really like for some of the older kids um, is the zones of regulation. And that uses more emotions um, as well as understanding I'm, you know, I'm in a zone and I'm calm. I'm in a green zone, I'm ready to learn. I'm in a yellow zone, something's uncomfortable. And then I'm in a red zone, I'm ready to explode. So it's actually using and pairing more emotions with the body regulation. So um, again, those are two really, really great programs um, to look into um, and you know, kind of help if, if the child is in need of that. So when we're looking at those behaviors and when we're looking at, okay, you know, here's, yes, what was the second one you said? Uh, the zones, you said of, zones. Yep, zones of regulation. Thank you. Yep. 
Um, so when we're looking at those behaviors, what we want to do is, again, going back to that pyramid, let's address the body. Because a lot of times, even if, you know, some of those behaviors might be tangible and those kind of things, if we can address the body, a lot of times some of those other functions of behaviors are not necessarily needed. Um, and so what we like to look at is using our mouth, using movement, using touch, using look, and using our ears and listening. So the first one is our mouth. Our mouth is actually the biggest grounding mechanism that we have. Um, and the best way to remember that is as soon as we are first born, we are actually trying to look to suck and we're moving our mouth to suck. And it's not actually just for that nutrients, it's actually for calming. Um, that roof of the mouth hits right into um, the amygdala and that is working on some of our emotional components. And so when we're able to activate that, we actually can activate proprioception and work on that calming piece. Um, additionally, the mouth is that first, you know, component to understand, you know, um, that suck, swallow, breathe synchrony. We need to have that in order to be able to get to self-regulation. If we can't breathe, we can't function and we are gonna continually be in that sympathetic nervous system because we don't have control of our breath. Additionally, because the mouth is so intertwined with our 12 uh, cranial nerves, it has a lot of different components and a lot of different interactions with um, a lot of our neurotransmitter and our neurotransmitter activation. So again, that goes back also, Darcy, what you had mentioned, maybe why biting is a pleasurable activity because there is a lot of different activation of the different um, cranial nerves as well. So ways to engage the mouth. Um, you know, there are a ton of different ways. And what's awesome, especially with homeschool um, compared to that, that classroom is, you know, especially even now, um, kids can't have gum. They, they don't allow water bottles and those kind of things. Where in actuality, having those water bottles does a heck of a lot for our nervous system to be able to help our nervous system slow down and get to that just right level of learning. So engaging sucking, the more and the harder we suck, the actual more proprioception we can get. And then the um, neurotransmitter of GABA increases. As soon as that increases, that means our body's safe. And we're gonna get right into that parasympathetic nervous system that says, hey, I feel great. Um, so there's sucking, using water bottles. I, you know, the smaller the straw, actually the better. Um, because that you really have to engage a lot of oral motor structure and a lot of proprioception within the mouth. The next thing are breaths, deep breaths. They are doing a ton of research right now on deep breathing and the way that deep breathing helps so much with grounding and activation is because it actually activates um, one of the cran cranial nerves, which is the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is a big nerve for grounding and getting towards that parasympathetic nervous system. And so when we can activate that vagus nerve, it also helps with digestion and sleep regulation and just that overall calming. The hard part is that a lot of times we will tell kids breathe. As soon as you give that cognitive piece of breathe, it actually makes all of us go, <laughs> And it takes even a quicker breath. And that's not engaging your diaphragm. The best way to do it is model it. In through your nose, out through your mouth. Or a lot of things we say is, you know what? Let's pretend there's tons of flowers. I want you to smell all the flowers. Oh, hold it. It feels awesome. Okay, now I want you to pretend like you've got this awesome birthday cake. And I want you to blow out all these candles. And so really working on the inhale and the exhale but repeating it over and over and, and really getting, so we can hit that, that vagus nerve to get into that parasympathetic system. Um, another way to engage the mouth is using food textures. Um, typically when an item is crunchy 
or chewy. That is actually going to bring that arousal system up. So for those kids, you know, like that, that low arousal kid that's like, oh, I'm so tired. If you start chewing on things, um, you know, I have that example of ice. Ice is great because not only the cold will increase that arousal, but you're actually activating the crunch and the proprioception within the jaw to say, hey, I'm ready to go. This is, this is great. Um, and again, it goes back to gum. Gum is super important um, you know, and, and super a great tool for a lot of kids. Um, this is one thing that I used um, when I played sports. And the reason why it is actually such a great thing is because it is center of your body. You're activating proprioception, but you're actually also activating both sides of the brain. And you're also pulling in central focus. Um, and so because when you're biting, you're biting at one single point, and so it will automatically bring the eyes into convergence. And so again, our brains are great and they do all this extra stuff that a lot of times we don't even know about. And so, you know, being able to pull these different aspects in are super important and it helps to pull it in, you know, throughout the day and have it as that, you know, to, as that need to help with that regulation piece. And then again, just going back to water, the importance of water. Our body is made up of water. We need that. And if we don't have that interoception to understand, you know, I'm hungry, I've got pain, I'm dehydrated, then we can use water to kind of help, um, you know, fulfill that need and it will help us feel better. And it does actually help when you have headaches and those kind of things. So really pulling in your mouth is such a great tool for a lot of different behaviors and things like that, because it is going to engage proprioception, which is going to engage the body to calm. I can, I can run on this one, Julie. And we actually only have like 10 minutes. Woo. Yeah, Perfect. so we have to go a little bit faster. Absolutely. But, um, movement is a very important uh, tool right now for the body, absolutely, because a lot of our kids um, I know with homeschooling, there's computer work uh, quite a bit as well. Is that correct? Got to unmute myself. That it all depends on the curriculum you choose. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, well, Lisa, I know we were always shouting the praises or going on the uh, soapbox of get your kids off the screens and move, move, move. And now it's like a nightmare to say that because it's even worse than ever. But um, as much movement as you can offer for the children, that is so important. And what we look at is we look at the vestibular system, which Julie talked about briefly, where that's our sense of our head movement in space. And that can be a very powerful type of movement that lasts even four to eight hours after 15 minutes of that. And I'll explain more of what that might look like. Um, proprioceptive movement is extremely useful. And actually this is our go-to. So we always say when in doubt, use proprioception. And that's our sense of body and space. It's our feeling of muscles and joint activation. And so we think of proprioception a lot of the times as pushing and pulling activities climbing types of activities, activities where we're uh, activating our muscles against gravity. So there's six, we look at movement as six different types of movement. And this is where, you know, when we look at kids move or do different things, we're like, ooh, you know, this is kind of like a, a research project in our own little brains of, let's watch that kid jump up and down and then see what, what type of response we get after that or let's watch that kid you know, do some sort of swinging front and back or going in circles or putting their head upside down because each different type of movement actually can affect the individual differently. Sometimes kids seek out certain movements that they, it's similar again to the behavior of like biting the hand or doing some sort of maladaptive behavior that the brain says, I love this. So you might think, oh, well, they really like it so they must need it. Not necessarily, they might do something that overstimulates them if they're doing it too much or just that movement might be overstimulating. So you really have to be that detective to watch. 
And then the proprioception two types we look at are the heavy body work um, and the crash and bump. Some, you know, I don't know if any of you guys do yoga and you're, you maintain in different poses for a long period of time. That's, that's heavy body work as well as lifting weights is heavy body work as well as just even pushing, pulling and carrying heavy things. And we look at that for our kids. How can we incorporate that throughout the day? Um, here are some just different movement tools, um, movement for transitions. So doing slower bear walks, crab walks, marching or hopping, getting outside as much as possible, of course, also get that vitamin D, which helps the arousal system and the sleep-wake cycle. And then incorporate, incorporating movement before and after sit-down activities um, and using heavy body work within the child's routine throughout the day. I know an example I can give, I work with a teenager who um, has a diagnose, dual diagnosis of ADHD and ODD. And we initially had talked about, oh, let's you know, get yourself off the computer and take a break and you know, do some movement. Oh, I don't have time for that. Okay. So then how about like three times a week get in the basement? And this was his idea, and I'll, you know, do my punching bag or I'll lift weights. Yeah, that didn't happen either. Well, what ended up working for him because he bought into this more, it was more meaningful for him, was to actually do job tasks around the house that he could earn some money from mom and dad, then he could be able to purchase something that he really wanted to purchase. That's how we got the movement into this boy, <clears throat> this boy to help out on a daily basis. And so that really also had, goes, sorry, mm -hmm. that also goes back and sometimes it's not the best example, but you look at someone like Michael Phelps who has that had that diagnosis and has of ADHD and the biggest tool that he found was proprioception, that's swimming. Swimming is a huge proprioceptive activity. And now, I mean, he's excelled at it. And so you gotta sometimes find those tools that are maybe outside of the box to be able to say, you know what? My body needs this. And especially as we get adults, you know, there are a lot of things that I, I, you know, I need to go for a walk. I, I know my body needs this. And so it's understanding what are those tools that your child needs? And then they're going to really understand, yes, I do need that information. Mm -hmm. Let's say the other quick, really, th uh, the quick thing to say too, is sometimes the kids don't want to participate in these types of, you know, swimming or leisure activities where you think, just go, you know, play soccer or go swimming or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and it's really about the fact that they don't know how to do it. Their body cannot figure it out. And that's where, again, an OT comes in. We just actually had a kiddo this week that for years he was challenged with being able to learn how to swim. And finally, I think, what is he like 11? He just yesterday was like, you know what, after working so hard with you guys, like I can do this and I can't believe I can do it. I think I want to join the swim team. So it sometimes just comes to that where they need things broken down and worked on therapeutically to get to that mastery motivation to want to move and do. So seating options, this is where there's kids that just need either more movement with the movement cushions or sitting on a ball or standing up, um, or they might need more boundaries. And that might be um, more of like a cube chair or a chair with arms or even a bean bag sometimes gives at least the proprioception, not so much um, of the support, depending on what their posture is like. So then, you know, the next thing is touch. Touch is super, super important. There's some good information on here on why touch is so important, but we, you know, have different receptors that is going to interpret light touch or deep touch. Deep touch is also part of that proprioception, which is part of that grounding. Um, but touch can also help with that focus and that attention. And, you know, there was, you know, what was a couple of years ago when all those fidget spinners came out. There's a reason for fidget spinners. And the reason is what happens is that it helps to give information to the tactile system so that can help your visual focus, your auditory focus, and those kind of things. So here we just put some ideas, different, you know, 
the best idea to have for fidgets are not the ones that you see at the end stand of Walgreens because usually those are loud and flashing and you know those kind of things. Those usually aren't the best. The ones that are the best are like paper clips, tops of pens, those kind of things where you can fidget with it and it's not gonna pull your visual attention. And kind of knowing and going with that, you should always have rules with you know hand fidgets. Letting the child know like, this is actually to help you pay attention. And so, you know, if it's to listen, in listening to you guys, if there's, you know, a lesson or those kind of things, um, to make sure that the eyes are on the person versus on the fidget. Um, and knowing that this is for you to calm. And a lot of times with fidgets, there is a lot of trial and error, for, or trial and error with it and kind of understanding what works, what doesn't work. Um, so again, those big, bright, flashy ones are not usually the best. Mm -hmm. Weighted options are also a great idea. Um, there are so many things out there now. Um, as I mentioned, you know, going up on Pinterest, um, you can definitely search our Therapeutic Links P Pinterest page for ideas of sensory um, input and those kind of things. Um, but you can also look up hand fidgets. There's a ton of DIY stuff. Um, using weight helps to pull in proprioception. Um, and so there's also some great activities. These are sock buddies, and these are usually filled with beans and things like that. That's a great thing to have on a child's lap to be able to kind of calm them down. So then the next, the next area we look at is look. And you know, really briefly, this is a big way to be a detective. Look around the room, what is going on? Is it really bright? Are you in a really cluttered place? Because when there's clutter, what's happening is the brain is always gonna start looking at all the different things. It's gonna pull in uh, peripheral vision, which turns on fight or flight. You need a space that is usually pretty organized and grounding to kind of help slow down that system. It's always super important to have visuals. Um, as I mentioned, you know, it's really hard if you're trying to give auditory directions and a child is going into shutdown because the auditory system is the first system to shut down. And so you're talking to them and it's like, you know, the peanuts, wah, 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 because they cannot hear you. It's not that they're not listening, they actually can't hear you. Um, and so really utilizing visuals and letting them know what is coming next. When you can give the body and the brain predict predictability, it is giving safety to the rest of the body. And, you know, just cues of, you know, um, lights, lights on is usually going to alert, lights off is going to slow, you know, help slow down your body. And again, here's just some ideas. There's some great DIY, like how to make a study carol, having those, co those cozy corners and just having those kind of like break spaces are actually super, super important. There's some more tools that we gave you, just some different pictures of it and those kind of things. Um, and then just very briefly, utilizing auditory, utilizing music. Um, when you can give um, music in the background and it's predictable, so a lot of Mozart, um, a, lot, a lot of instrumental nursery rhymes, because a lot of our kids know those, they are, they're gonna know what that next beat is. That is actually very calming for the body. There's a reason why lullabies are 60 beats per minute. And that's because that's the heart rate to get at, to get into that nice sleep and get into those brain waves for sleep. And so just being conscious, you know, of what are the, what is the, all the auditory information? And I will tell you that there's a lot of things kids will hear that you will never hear. Um, and so a lot of times what you might have to do is drone those out to be able to help with that focus. And then lastly, with that is use your voice. Um, if Tracy and I were to talk, you know, kind of like this the whole entire time, we would totally lose everyone's interest. But we are very animated and we change the intonation of our voice. We talk faster, we talk slower. Um, and that is a reason, we do that for a reason to make sure we're still pulling in attention and those kind of things. So really being mindful of that, understanding that and you know utilizing as much as possible. And here I did again, put some um, different things. There are some great YouTube videos that have like 
pairing music and movement together. Um, so there's a link there that you guys can go to. Um, we definitely use it in quite a bit of our um, different um, virtual sessions and stuff like that too. Um, again, noise canceling headphones, using music for transitions. There's Rainmaker um, stuff because that is a very low frequency. It helps you know, with that calming system. And so this is again, just information to note and just noting that if you give this information, it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna help. And there's reasons why. And our body needs a lot of intensity for certain things and not of a lot of intensity of other things. So just a, you know, kind of an FYI, take a peek at this because it does give a bunch of information. So, you know, we kind of talked about this throughout if you are seeing any red flags that you're like, I have no idea how to, you know, get through this. I am seeing some major behaviors. I, I don't necessarily know how to get all the team together. Contact us. We're going to be able to really look at that whole picture. We're going to look at, is there sensory stuff? Is there other um, brainstem level stuff that's going on that is not allowing to go to the cortex? Um, you know, a big note that we are, you know, ther occupational therapy is medically based. And so it is typically um, covered by insurance. So, you know, our contact information is there. Feel free to definitely give us a call. <laughs> we have one question in the chat. Yes. Um, someone is asking uh, their 14 year old boy, uh, they believe has some sort of auditory processing problem. It has problems with language output, writing, speaking, spelling, et cetera. And they want to know specifically if you work with those types of problems. Yes, we definitely do. Um, there, when there's auditory processing and especially that understanding of that writing component, there is some motor planning discrepancies in there. And so what, again, we're gonna kind of look at it may not just be the auditory, auditory processing piece, there could be other, other things that are going on. And so again, we're gonna utilize what the strength is to see how can we help balance out that auditory processing. Again, that also pairs in a lot with executive functioning. And yes, we do a ton of executive functioning work to really look at pinpoint what are the supports that we can give to make that so much easier for the child. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Very good. All right. Any, we're, we're just about out of time, but anybody else? One last question? No, but we're getting lots of thank yous. Oh, <laughs> good. Good. Well, as you all can tell, Julie oh, can and I Tracy just... have their stuff. Darcy's got a question. Oh, Darcy, did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, can you just talk a little bit about like, what does an OT eval look like? Yeah, so an OT eval, typically it's just an hour long. Um, <clears throat> we have an assessment tool that we choose based on what your concerns are. So we'll, we send out paperwork for you to fill out. And then by looking at that and just knowing what your concerns are, we might choose uh, a tool where we ask the child to do certain movement activities and we are able to then score to see where they're at with those movement activities compared to same age peers. Uh, it could be fine motor, it could be gross motor. We also look at their reflex integration. So that's something that we're heavily trained in as well. And there's a lot of crossover with sensory processing. That's something that we hold ourselves back on throwing into the presentation because it's a whole bunch of other information too. And it's very exciting. Uh, so actually I can send you guys to the website. It's the Maskatova method, um, M-A-S-G-U-T-O-V-A method.com. And so what we do is we have the individual um, lay on a, a massage table. We call them body work tables. And we're able to actually look and see how their body responds to certain tactile proprioceptive stroking patterns that we do on the feet, on the back, as well as different inputs uh, where we might have them pull up to sit or hold certain positions. When we note that their body might go into a certain pattern, 
that actually relates to functional concerns. And so that helps us guide our treatment plan as well, because we do a lot with the reflex integration as a treatment approach. And again, it looks like in order to treat that, we work on certain tactile proprioceptive strokes on the body as well as repatterning that reflex. So if also too, there's like, we have, a, we have some great information on uh, the reflex integration difficulties as well as learning and attention difficulties. And they cor correlate the reflex that might be not integrated or not presenting itself or disorganized and how that relates to different learning difficulties, specific ones with each reflex. And we have one more question in the chat or another one. Um, somebody is wondering if animals such as dogs are helpful or more of a crutch in the long term that will be hard to function without. I, I was just looking to see if my dog's here because I am actually training my dog to uh, be an animal assisted um, therapy dog. And actually there is a ton of research out there. And the, the thing that animals do is they provide a connection for a lot of kids that sometimes cannot connect with individuals. Um, there's again, lots of research out there. A lot of kids, we can read emotions super fast on people. You can't read necessarily emotions on dogs. And when you interpret an emotion differently on a person, you may not want to connect with them. And so what they're showing is that you have that affection with animals because they're not giving you those, um, you know, different gestural cues that maybe, um, you know, a, a peer or an individual would also. And a lot of times animals are predictable. Lots of humans, lots of peers are unpredictable. So yes, it is a great thing. And then going back just quickly with the evaluation piece, especially with COVID, we do see people in clinic. Um, we have all our rules in place with mask wearing and those kind of things. We also can do virtual sessions as well. Um, and the other thing is based on the age, um, you know, a lot of times parents want to be in, we can have you in for the evaluation. It is helpful for us because sometimes we can ask questions. However, sometimes depending, especially those teenage kids, they don't necessarily want their parents there. And that is okay too. We set a time where we actually call you guys, talk to you in those kind of things. So there's a lot of underlying pieces that can go hand in hand and why there's, you know, different problems and stuff. So we really try to delve into a lot of different things. All right. Well, this has been awesome. I feel like my brain is on is on overload with all the uh, information that you gave us. So thank you so much. Gosh, what a thorough presentation. And uh, not only on sensory issues, but also touching on the autism and some life skills. And so thank you very much, Tracy and Julie, for putting this all together. And so- I have another you... question. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, how long does treatment typically last? So an individual session um, is typically 60 minutes. Um, that's, you know, kind of our go-to. Um, we can do more or less, depending. We really look at insurance, too, um, to kind of give those boundaries. And then as for time frame, it's all different. Um, you know, again, sensory is not black and white. Um, sometimes when we provide a foundational system that works really well, then you might start seeing some other behaviors because what's happening is that whole system is reorganizing. Um, but we are very, you know, we very look at goals and things like that. And we talk to the parents, hey, I want to really hit on this. Can we keep going? So that duration can be completely different for every single child. Very good. All right. Good questions, man. All right, well, you've got their contact information there on the screen, so please take note of that. that if you want to email them, um, make sure you also check out their website, wealth of information there as well, and um, as well as the YouTube links that they have got available for us. And so uh, thank you very much, Tracy and Julie. Wonderful. I'm glad this finally worked out, Tracy. Yay. <laughs> here. Sooner or later. All right, and then just to remind everybody else, our next meeting is Thursday, December 10th. 
Uh, Gina Mayo, mom of eight, will be talking about homeschooling, um, variety ages of children, and she'll have a lot of practical information for us as, for that as well. So, all right, thank you for joining us. Have a good night. Thank, thank you, everyone. everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye.